Good afternoon, uh, Rotarians and guests pre present at the uh, Softel today and also online, including some very special people from Brazil. So why don't we give them a bit of a clap for the people from Brazil? We'll hear more about that a little bit later. It's my pleasure to be uh, your MC today and actually double up to provide the reflection and thanks. Um, to that end, and knowing that our guest speaker and past member, Elaine Saunders, is talking on hearing loss, can I get a show of hands that you can all hear me okay? <laughs> okay, down there? Good on you, mate. Okay. We would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation and also pay our respects to Elders past, present and future and extend that respect to all Indigenous Australians present today. So I'll move on with my reflection and thanks. It's hard to believe that two months has passed since we hosted thousands of Rotarians to Melbourne for our friendly and highly successful World Convention. Sports, be they professional or amateur, team or individual, are very much part of our everyday lives. Melbourne is once again playing host to thousands of visitors and competitors for the Women's World Cup of Soccer, with the Matildas capturing the nation and all of us the other night with their 4-0 victory. Unfortunately, Melbourne, like so many cities, cannot hide the tra tragic statistics of rising homelessness, homelessness on our streets. Personally, I have not seen the city of Melbourne with so many sad and homeless people and their current economy is likely to seriously worsen the situation. I've been coming into town for 50 years and it is tragic to see it. The 7th to the 13th of August is Homeless Week 2023 and Rotary needs to continue our community welfare support for a range of organisations like the Salvation Army and Launch House and a number of other projects that we're involved with. The big issue is one of those organisations we continue to support, enabling vendors on the street to sell their publications. Community Street Soccer and the Homeless Soccer World Cup, organised by the big issue in recent years, has provided participants the opportunity to represent Australia and boost their confidence. Our honorary member, Lord Mayor Sally Cap, wrote yesterday, of the devastation to learn the Commonwealth Games would not proceed in 2026. She did, however, welcome the news from the state government that significant investment will be made in affordable housing. Let's hope a small percentage of the billions ostensibly saved by cancelling the Games will be directed towards the tragic state of homelessness in Victoria. Members, visitors and guests, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our fifth meeting of this Brokery Year and our 4,096th club meeting in our 102nd year. It's wonderful to see you all here, including those attending online. Our guest speaker today is Professor Elaine Saunders, esteemed biomedical engineer, audiologist, audio, audiological scientist, businesswoman, author of, and former dear club member of ours. Elaine will be speaking on hearing loss, more of a problem than we thought. And is accompanied today by her guest, Deirdre Wilmot, president of Rotary Club of Woodend, and Dr. James Fielding, CEO of Ordera. Um, we'll may as well clap. Okay, of course. Elaine will be more fully introduced shortly by the Chair of the Day, Dr. Rosemary. In the meantime, well, we've acknowledged, so we'll, uh, we'll pass for that. Uh, we have here today for induction into the club, uh, Manuel Felipe Marquez. Manuel. Uh, I'm having trouble with the video. So welcome everyone from Brazil. Um, we have visiting Rotarians, visitors and guests of members as well. Um, visiting Rotarians, of course, we have Adira, who we mentioned a moment ago, and Natalie O from the Rotary Club of Preston. Natalie, you're over there. Okay. 
Um, and of course, our, our dear friends, Amit and Nova Gill, uh, guests of Peter Rogers. Um, please joining me in, in making all of our visiting Rotarians and uh, guests welcome. Now, may I ask uh, Manuel, Philippe, Marquez and Joe uh, Crowston to come forward for an introduction into membership of the club. And I also invite their sponsors, Peter, past president Robert Fisher and Deb Finn Yu to make the introduction. Thank you very much, President Chris. It's uh, particularly wonderful that we have online Manuel's parents and also the president of the Rotary Club in Brazil, where Manuel was, uh, I guess, still is an honorary member. So a particular warm welcome to those online from Brazil. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce formally for membership of Rotary Melbourne, Manuel Philippe Marquez, who holds the position of project manager and will have the classification of marketing and communications. He is an honorary member of the Rotary Club of Cruzeiro in Brazil. He will be a member of Central Two Group and will be known in the club as Manuel, and I will continue to try and be his Rotary mentor. Uh, President Chris, it gives me much pleasure to introduce for membership to the club Joanne Crowston, who holds the position of um, acting fundraising manager and will have the classification of corporate designee, uh, the Bionics Institute. Uh, she will be a member of the Hawthorne group and will be known in the club as Joe. So Manuel, Philippe Marquez and Joe Crowston, welcome. We welcome you as members of the Rotary Club of Melbourne. Today you enter an organisation of more than 1.2 million members in over 35,000 clubs in more than 200 companies, companies, countries, embracing the internationality of Rotary. We believe that you have the personal and professional qualities that will ensure the principles of Rotary will be safe in your keeping. The Rotary badge you will receive in a moment, and I hope you will wear it with pride indicates your commitment to the object of Rotary to which we all aspire to encourage the ideal of service above self. We expect that you will become ambassadors from us into your community in which you live and we ask that you convey Rotary's aims in all that you do. We look forward to your pursuing with us the great work of Rotary. So with this expectation, I offer you the right hand of fellowship and ask that members rise and join me in welcoming you to the membership of our club. Welcome. I will ask, I will ask the sponsors now to present the badge. To Now I ask Manuel and Joe to respond briefly. Thank you, maybe a minute or so. Well, Last night I was talking to my dad and he asked me if I did write something for today. And I said, uh, it's better you know that talk from my heart. Uh, because I remember um, the very first time that I cried in 2018. Uh, I used to be a normal member in my club in Brazil, Cruzeiro. And I just come to the Rotary office here. And uh, the first I spoke to Joe. And at that time, I even couldn't speak English properly. Uh, my speak skills were like zero. Uh, <laughs> uh, and after that, like, I got involved with the Rotary here and I met Mr. Robert, who gave me a lot of support with his family as well. Um, I just wanted to express my, uh, how grateful I am for all the opportunities that you guys gave to me here. Um, and I'm very happy to be uh, to become a um, member of this important club in Australia, the biggest one. Uh, and for me, it's like, I feel proud of myself because like as an international student, someone who come 
from Brazil. I don't used to know anyone in Australia or in Melbourne, and now I'm part of this uh, select group. I would like to uh, ask you if I could just say a few words in Portuguese to my mom, to my family. My dad, he can't speak English, so probably he's um, understand very well. Um, so, um, just one minute, please. Para o pessoal que está no Brasil, minha mãe, meu pai, quero agradecer vocês aí pela oportunidade, pelo carinho, apoio que vocês sempre me deram para buscar meus objetivos. E aqui em nome do presidente Rodolfo, do Rotary Clube de Cruzeiro, cumprimentar também o Claudio que está aqui com a gente, e o presidente Newton, meu sempre presidente, Newton da Rocha, que foi quem é meu padrinho no Rotary Clube de Cruzeiro. E hoje eu estou aqui representando vocês com, com muita alegria de saber que tudo começou aqui. Hoje, olha só aonde eu cheguei e que eu posso aprender muito aqui e compartilhar com vocês. Aí um dia, muito obrigado por tudo. Eu preciso, me deram só dois minutos. Para quem, né? Mas é, eu preciso ser rápido. Uh, coming back here, guys. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I hope you work more to make uh, Melbourne more stronger than it is. Uh, and I'm sure uh, together we can create hope in the world. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you for this lovely welcome. Um, I don't know if you can tell, but I, I'm from England originally. And um, I've lived in London. I grew up near London. I've lived in Sydney. I've lived in San Diego. I've lived in Singapore. And I've just said to Robert, who's sitting next to me, that there's nowhere like Melbourne. Melbourne is the best city in the world. Just, it definitely is. So um, I'm really proud to be a member of um, the Melbourne Rotary Club. It's um, fantastic. And uh, two years ago, I started work at the Bionics Institute. And um, this is a great lunch to come to because um, Elaine um, is, is um, a huge part of the history of the Bionics Institute. And um, it, it is obviously started by um, Graham Clark, Professor Graham Clark, to develop the cochlear implant. And um, I'm not sure if Elaine will go into that, but um, she's. Um, well well across that history but um we have now expanded into many many areas um alzheimer's arthritis chronic pain um something that touches everyone and um i'm really looking forward to um letting you know all about the research we're doing because um, I get really excited every time I talk to a researcher. I'm in awe of our um, engineers, they're just fabulous. So um, I'm really excited to be able to share that with you. And then um, just one just one short story, um, talking about the bilingualism here. Um, my kids went to primary school in San Diego, came home at the age of five. There were 31 languages spoken in that school in San Diego. And they said, mommy, mommy, um, can I have a second language? <laughs> and I was like, I'm really sorry. That's one thing I can't deliver. Um, so I'm super impressed that you've, you've, you've taken on a second language there, Manuel. And, um, and I look forward to meeting all of you. And I'll be, I'll be speaking in English <laughs> for sure, because I, I couldn't give that to them. But thank you. Just uh, moving to a notice uh, before we move to the speaker. So next week is 0808. So we'll be awarding our Monash, our annual Monash medal, along with lunch and presentations on the Wednesday, the 0808 committee would like to invite all members to attend the service at the Shrine on Tuesday, 8 August, commemorating the Battle of Amiens at 7.45 a.m. for an 8 a.m. start. It's a magnificent ceremony and service, and uh, of course, we will be uh, laying a wreath um, representing our club. If you haven't managed to get to the Shrine service, please come and do so. Uh, there is also a subsequent event, not on that day, a few days later at the Legislative Assembly. Um, that's also a, a wonderful uh, memorial service uh, to, to John Monish. Um, I will now draw the raffle.
All right. And today's winner is not, may not be Elaine, due to conflict of interest reasons. No, let's not worry about that. So black, E65. Oh, wow. Deborah, well done. Uh, and now to the business of the day. Without further ado, I call to the podium our Chair of the Day, Dr. Rosemary Nixon, to take over our meeting. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Professor Elaine Saunders. Elaine started as a classroom assistant in a school for profoundly deaf children at the age of 17. She sub subsequently became an audiological scientist, an engineer, a researcher, the founder of Blamey Saunders, a professor, a mentor, a consultant, a director, but most importantly to us, uh, she's been a Rotarian, a Paul Harris fellow, and is very involved with a Rotary Action Group on Hearing. Welcome, Elaine. Firstly, thank you so much for having me here back as a speaker. Um, it's absolutely delightful to be here. I in, have really enjoyed being part of our club in Wood End. It's a fantastic club, and I'm really pleased our president has come here today, Deirdre. Um, it was with some sorrow I left uh, Melbourne, but uh, I live up there and was no longer coming into town once we were all locked down. So uh, thank you. I want to talk to you today about um, hearing. The, my remit was to talk about both uh, what it means to you as Rotarians uh, personally and what it means to us as Rotarians as a global health problem. So in 20 minutes I'm going to give you a very quick overview um, and I'm going to start with something a little improbable. Um, before I go into that I also am pleased to have with me um, James Field, Dr James Fielding who is the CEO of Ordera um, where I'm an independent director and I'm an independent director there because I think what they're doing is fantastic. Um, so I don't know if he'll be available afterwards to chat to, but I encourage you to if you can. Um, so as I said, I'm gonna start with something a little improbable. I don't think any of you would have been to a talk on hearing that started this way. I'm hoping the video plays and you'll be entertained for about um, a bit less than a minute. Um, and I couldn't end up, edit out um, Simon Cowell. So, Joe, will we play the video if possible? What would you do if I sing at a tune? Would you stand up and walk out on me? No! Lend me your ear and I'll sing you a song. I will try not to sing out of key. Before you all think I've lost my marbles, um, <laughs> standing up here as invited to the Rotary Club of Melbourne, and I show you a video of a, a slightly shy mouse and a bunny who thinks she's a diva. Um, and that little girl, incidentally, is 12 that did that. Um, 
how many of you, well, you don't really need to answer this, I'm going to guess, but um, I'm sure most of you get absorbed in that and think what you're watching is a bunny who thinks she's a diva um, and a, a mouse singing, because that's what it looked like. So what I'm highlighting there is that eyes and ears go together with hearing. So if you have hearing difficulties, don't forget that those two engines are really good at working. And I also want to project you into the world of a deaf child who wouldn't have the sound, who would only have thought there was a mouse and a deaf bunny singing, I mean, a diva bunny. So they work together, but when we think of children who have virtually no hearing, their world is one of seeing sound and not hearing it at all. Uh, can we have the next slide? Oh, that's that, sorry, that's it, yeah. Um, I kind of rely on seeing them. And what I wanted to talk about with how we hear is lots of people will show you in talks on hearing pictures of the anatomy of the ear. I usually end up when I see these pictures thinking the inside of the ear is about this big, um, which clearly it isn't. The job of the ear is to take sound and convert it into nerve pulses that goes to the brain. So the majority of the work is done in that bottom box or the bottom three boxes in that when you're hearing and listening, your ear is doing the detecting and coding in a remarkable way. Um, and the rest of the auditory system is in the nerve pathway and the brain. The cochlear implant, and this is all I'm going to say about cochlear implants, actually just takes over that function of the conversion of sound into a nerve, an electrical impulse. Um, it's not in any way belittling its technology. It's, there's a fair bit of complexity in there, but it, um, it's absolutely life-changing for people who get it, for children who get it. Um, in particular, um, a child who gets a cochlear implant, uh, young as a baby, will be in normal school with normal language by age five. That is actually quite remarkable. And I'll come back to, just to allude to that later, in that is not a solution available to the majority of the world's deaf children. Um, so we have the next slide, please. So the picture on the uh, left is uh, saying the same thing in a slightly different way. The spiral at the bottom is a, a diagram of your inner ear showing how sound is coded. And that coding is taken faithfully to the brain and reproduced. Um, if you could just click it again, Joe. And again. If, um, if there is no hearing for any period of time, so for example, if um, someone acquires hearing loss after birth, um, as a, older adults or for some other reason, and there, that hearing is not stimulated in any way, then that patterning ceases to become a faithful representation and can sound scrambled. So people who've had hearing loss and don't address it, they won't have that faithful reproduction in the brain, which is why I, James, everyone who works in the field will say, if you have hearing difficulties, do something about it, because you need to keep that system active. It's the old use it or lose it, I'm afraid. Um, so the diagram on the right, just reminding you that uh, getting the sound in is the first important thing, and then it's focusing and using it. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so talking about how big a problem is hearing loss, well, it's pretty common. So in Australia, we reckon there's about 4 million people who have um, a measurable degree of hearing loss. By far the majority actually don't do anything about it of any kind, and they, and you should. Um, about one in two, that's every other person over 70 has some degree of hearing difficulty. Um, now I know there are some people in this room who are really good and are going to uh, own up to that, but uh, giving talks publicly, I find most people will say, oh, I know about hearing loss, he's got it. Um, about um, one in three people have hearing loss that is caused by exposure to loud sounds. 
It's pretty hard to avoid loud sounds during life, but the uh, big tip is you should try to. And in a very related reason, most farmers over 60 will have quite a significant hearing loss. And I'm afraid to say that uh, object on the left belonged to me until relatively recently. And being a good Rotarian, I gave it to the Rotary Club of uh, Yay, who now use it to look after a local national park. Um, <clears throat> Yes, I did drive it, and I was uh, slightly afraid that I, one of my family would get killed driving it. Deafness was a secondary issue. But most people, it's really quite recent that people have understood that we need to use hearing protection. So next slide, please. I'm going to be very naughty in this. I'm, I'm going to have to read it to turn sideways a little bit. So what, what is too loud? Well, I'm afraid to say, and some of you will know this, and uh, Amanda was very helpful in me solving this, the sound level in the House of Friendship on day one was way over safety levels. And had it continued, every single exhibitor would have gone home deaf than they arrived. Um, I'm happy to say that it was turned down after the day one, um, and a fair bit of agitation from me. Um, the Richmond's Tiger Roar, I thought this would be a good controversial one. You can listen to it for about 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then there's a list of more conventional things there. Fireworks uh, that we might know about, jackhammers, boat racing. I had a friend who was, did competitive boat racing and I was appalled at the number of small children that were there without any kind of protective headphones. Um, car racing, at the Grand Prix, they hand out ear earbuds on your way in. Um, live amplified music, not all of it, but often. Don't sit under the speaker. My hearing difficulties, I've confessed earlier, are probably due to uh, going to concerts by The Who back in my misspent youth. Um, and a lot of home machinery, but I've seen people put on their ear defenders when they're using their, um, I know, their, their rifle and they're not putting it on when they pick up the leaf mower or blower. Or, so it has to be consistent. Hearing loss from loud music is like, or loud noise, is like, um, it's like sun, sun exposure. Damages the cells. The more you have it and the stronger it is, the worse the damage. Now, adult hearing loss can sneak up on you, or well, it does sneak up. You don't realize that it's happening. I have a picture here of a frog being boiled. I have never boiled a frog, I'm happy to say. But I understand that should you wish to, if you put it into a boiling water, it'll jump straight out. You put it into cold water and heat it up slowly, it won't notice. So hearing loss is a bit like that. It kind of sneaks up on us and we don't notice Despite the TV getting a bit less clear, we're having trouble talking in groups, um, our significant other is telling us. Um, and there is a side effect. People, and I'm gonna say this as a woman who's on a number of boards, we all tend to try and talk louder when we lose our hearing. And unfortunately in a, in a meeting situation, Men sound loud and women squeak. Um, so it's, it's not very good. So I have a personal reason for wanting everyone I work with to do something about their hearing. But it does sneak up on us and usually people say sounds are not clear. And that's because you'll use it, it's for two reasons. One is that as um, you lose hearing as an adult, it's usually the bits of speech that have clarity in it, the consonants that we lose first. The other is, and I've heard people say, um, I wish people would talk more slowly, is that actually as we get older, our hearing kind of slows down. It's actually the nerve conduction that becomes a bit slower, but the effect is that our hearing effectively slows down. So hearing loss sneaks up on you. If you think you have hearing problems, you probably do, and I would suggest doing something about it. That might be getting headphones, it might be getting hearing aids, but you need to do something. So next slide, please. 
and the global numbers, hearing loss is on the rise. The World Health Organization has flagged it as a health um, priority. And what they first of all want is for people to try and avoid it. That's not just loud sounds. There are, there are other reasons. So it's very linked to a you know, poor diet, poor nutrition. Um, but hearing loss is on the rise. Now these figures, which say that uh, in, by 2030, we'll have 630 million people globally with hearing loss. That's actually quite marked hearing loss. In the World Health Organization figures, they don't actually call it hearing loss until the point where you would have a lot of trouble hearing me up here. So next slide, please. So if we look at bigger numbers where we include mild loss, it's actually quite a lot more. And mild loss, as many of you all know, your hearing loss may be considered mild, it's a nuisance. Um, and sometimes, and particularly for children, it actually changes on a day-to-day -day basis. It goes up and down. So next slide, please. And I want to bring this home. In Australia, we are very, very lucky. We have excellent hearing health services, much of it free for many people. However, we have a particular problem in that the ear health for our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is very poor. Um, and a lot of the reasons are similar to the reasons we have an issue with trachoma. A um, lot of common issues. And I know I've talked to some of the people on the trachoma teams and said, you know, if you took a hanky in your kit and taught the kids to blow their nose, that would be a really good addition. I also talked to someone at the Rotary Convention who was working with one of the Indigenous communities and, uh, and he said, we're working on hearing. And I said, what are you doing? He said, well, they asked us to buy washing machines so that we can wash the pillowcases. I thought, how incredibly sensible. And that came from the community. Um, so it's a big problem. What happens is that the children get middle ear disease. And if that's untreated, it can become permanent. And it's uh, young people with hearing loss in uh, the indigenous communities that are significantly overrepresented in the jail population. So that, that is a problem in Australia and I'm flagging it as a problem, not, pre not presenting you with a solution. Um, next slide, please. So untreated hearing difficulties can lead to lots of difficulties. So let's look at adults first and the sort of acquired hearing loss we get to make people a bit grumpy, frustrated, tired, um, can lead on to depression, mental health issues, because people get isolated, um, and hence loneliness, social isolation, people stop going out so much because it's too hard to hear, and that then leads into not going out at all. And it has been associated with an increased risk of dementia. I'm not going into that a lot. There's a lot of data, but I, uh, there's a lot of complexity in the analysis around that area. Um, I think what we're confident about is that if there are other signs that um, predispose one to dementia, having hearing loss certainly won't help. But one of the reasons that area is so fraught is a PhD I supervised or co-supervised some years ago. We want to look at the effect of um, auditory training and hearing aids on older people in, in, in care who uh, were suspected of having dementia, what we found is that most of them had very significant hearing loss. Um, so all the cartoons you've seen in the past about being daft, being confused with being deaf, these people were in care for dementia care and no one had properly tested their hearing. This is in Melbourne. Um, so if you have hearing loss, do something about it. As I said, most people don't. Um, using hearing aids isn't an admission of ageing. Quite honestly, I think it's the best makeover you can have to look younger. Um, hearing aids needn't be unsightly. Uh, in the company we used to run, we made it, um, one of our goals was to have hearing aids that really looked lovely and we in fact won the Australian Good Design Award with it. Unfortunately, that hearing aid is not available now. Um, anyone thinks that hearing aids are unsightly, I will just, the, the uh, disclaimer here is that's my daughter there wearing a hearing aid. 
Um, so if anyone says that's unsightly, speak to me later. Um, <clears throat> hearing better, frankly, is more fun, whether you're listening through headphones, the TV or music, or whether you're using hearing aids in a group situation. I much prefer to put a positive spin on it, rather than saying you're likely to go get dementia. Let's take it down to the side and say, you actually like to have more fun and more enjoyment if you were, use hearing help. Um, and you actually don't need to pay a small fortune to hear better. Um, I'm happy to say that was one of the uh, lasting changes from Blamey Saunders, that we disrupted the world a bit on that, um, with more impact actually in the US than in Australia, where you can still pay a fortune. But there are other companies now supplying hearing aids at very reasonable prices. Um, look around. So next slide, please. 4 million children around the world live with hearing loss and I thought I couldn't do better than put up a statement by um, Mahala here um, who said herself in an introduction to the World Health Organization report on hearing because I have also suffered hearing loss I know this doesn't need to be an obstacle to education with access to health care rehabilitation and technology people with disabling hearing loss can participate equally in education employment and their communities. Hearing loss doesn't keep them from reaching their full potential does, poverty and discrimination does. So uh, let's just next slide please. Hold that thought and keep clicking Joe, it's animated. Um, and again, so just stop there. Um, let's say with mild hearing loss they might, or fluctuating loss as many children will get, um, can lead to a lack of self-confidence, it can lead to disturbed interpersonal relationships, actually that applies to adults. I once had a, a, a woman get up and hit her husband on the head with a book in the middle of one of my presentations because she reckoned I had established that uh, she, he, he wasn't taking any notice of the fact that uh, she told him he didn't hear. But let's stop at the third box and just think about that for a minute and think back to that video can be delayed or absent spoken language. I just think of your life growing up and how your life and career and well-being would have been different with no spoken language. So the next, next click again, please. So what that then leads to is decreased education, if any at all, less work opportunities, and most likely poverty. And that is the reality for the majority of the children in the world who have hearing loss. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to skip over this and just say that it, um, cost is a problem, but so are logistics. So watch for you. Again, thinking back to that video, you can do lots of things when you're listening, but if you wear hearing aids, make sure you turn your head, not just your eyes, your head to the speaker because you have on those hearing aids um, some directional microphones. And if their point, your head is pointing both of those to the person who is speaking, you've got kind of like a tunnel of hearing. Best bit of a hearing aid, never buy hearing aids that haven't got adaptive directional microphones. They will be known by the, as something else like crowd hearing enhancer or something like that, but that's what they are. And the reason I put the doggies there is because, actually I like dogs, but they're, they're you, you look at, if you've got a dog or look at your friend's dog, he or she will look at you and turn head to you when, you're, when it wants to communicate. So use the hearing aids and turn your head to the sound. Um, next one, I'm coming to an end because I think I must be running to the end of time. So what can we do? Um, I'll just reduce this to look at the World Health Organization report on hearing from which this was taken. Look at ear health and care and the facts in it. Most important as I say, it's about trying to prevent the problem. And some hearing problems are core health, particularly in children. Um, so read that report, strongly encourage it. And last slide, next please. And you can join me in 
the Rotary Action Group for hearing. Um, this is like any of the Rotary Action Groups, um, a global group. And like all the action groups, the goal really is to share information so that people can plan better projects. Um, we in Australia have extraordinary expertise in hearing. Um, we have companies like James's, we have the Bionics Institute, we have the Ear Science Institute in, um, in West Australia, and we have Australian Hearing and Now. We have extraordinary talent and knowledge. I'm wanting to share that by being very active in this group. It's likely that by the end of the year, we will be able to bring the headquarters of that into Australia. Um, at the moment, it's in New York, um, but that process is kind of starting. And here's my promo to finish with, or two promos. One, if you sign up today, I will pay for your first year's membership. Um, so you have to hop online, the website's there, it's most improbable, but if you Google Action Group on Hearing, you'll get it. The second thing is Rotary Club of Wood End is really driving the secretariat of that. Rotary Club of Wood End will bring in the Action Group on Hearing. I would just love to collaborate, and I know I speak for our president too, um, with Rotary Club of Melbourne. We will need to put a board together and we especially want a treasurer. Um, so that's my promo, and you haven't heard the laugh from me on this. Uh, I have your number. <laughs> so I will finish there with um, just the general exhortation. This is a big world health problem, and we need to help with it. That was fantastic, Elaine. Uh, well, we're looking for questions. Uh, it's a concern with some of the young folk with their uh, their uh, ear pods in all the time. Um, what information do we have about uh, hearing loss in, in young folk? It needs to be at safe levels. I always say to people, it oh, needs to be at safe levels. Um, I'm very mindful I've got the CEO of Ordera here. Because um, what I normally say is you need to have the best earphone, the best headset you possibly can. Um, because what you want to do is block out the outside. If you use headphones of any kind with personal listening devices that um, don't block out the outside world, people just turn them up. If you can hear someone else's hearing system on the train, just think how loud it is to them. The other thing is it's about dosage. So if your kids are in school or your grandkids in school, most schools don't understand hearing conservation and they don't understand that it might be um, an hour trumpet practice in a reverberant music room, but then there's orchestra practice, then there's woodwork, and then there's listening to the music player in the train on the way home. And that all adds up. So the general advice is use really good um, head for headset. Uh, and the second one is be mindful of the overall dosage of sound. Further questions? Yes, please. Well, well done. <clears throat> Welcome back. Thank you. Um, how much would you expect to pay for for a set of uh, hearing aids in Australia? And do do you do the old ones deteriorate, or is it just that you need to get new ones because the technology is improved? It's an excellent question, Peter. Um, I don't think I'm going to answer how much you're going to pay, except that the vertically integrated retail chains charge a lot. Um, and what, these days, if somebody asks me what hearing aids they should buy, I usually tell them to go online to America Hears, which uses our hearing technology. Um, and it's you can fully manage your own hearing aids. Um, that was one of the question what was the one was the cost so I'm dodging the answer the, uh, do they share it so um, hearing aids are like many electronic devices they're all basically the same except they're de-featured so the more you pay the more features are turned on um, um, do they deteriorate depends very much whose hands they're in um, the government uh, allows you is it four years, James? Three now, before they consider that uh, you're eligible for, a, for a, a, a new set. So that's considered reasonable. I've met people who've 
destroyed hearing aids in a day. I've met people who've kept hearing aids for 15 years. The caveat I'd put on that was that before about 1998, frankly, hearing aids didn't work very well. So if you have a really ancient pair of hearing aids that you're managing to keep going, in, there was a study done actually in 1996 that showed the state-of-the-art digital hearing aids at that time in background noise were nearly as good as ear trumpets, but not quite. Um, so it depends how old they are, but I would say that if you look after them, you should get five years out of them. Um, there are lots of it. The, most of the additional features now are around connectivity and things like that, so it depends what you want. Elaine, with this sprightly young group, <laughs> how many people do you think in this room would have hearing aids? Uh, well, by just looking around, think, guessing the age demographic and adding mine in, uh, probably about half. Let's, let's have a show of hands. <laughs> Who thinks they might be heading that way? <laughs> okay. The sooner you do it, the easiest. And I will linger for half an hour afterwards in case there are questions that anyone would like to ask me about their hearing, would they prefer not to share it with the whole room? <laughs> like they've just done. Uh, one more brief question from anyone? Here we go. Elaine, can you, can you hear that? Yeah. One of my team has a cochlear implant and he, Bluetooth, he Bluetooths from his phone straight into his inner ear. Um, can you do that with a hearing aid? Uh, the sound from a hearing aid has got to go through the outer parts of the ear. So what the cochlear implant does very cunningly is bypasses all of that and turns it, it really replaces the function of the ear and turns it straight into a nerve signal. But Joe's question reminded me, there's just a little tiny tad extra to add to my answer to Peter, is that for those of you who pursue academic journals, seminars in hearing this month is entirely about hearing aids and helping to untangle the, uh, um, the world of, let's say, online, over-the-counter, direct from the pharmacy, via an audiologist. Uh, I'm happy to say that I was a co-editor and uh, an author of two of the papers in my capacity as an honorary fellow at the Bionics Institute, so it's one of their publications, actually. <laughs> Thanks, Elaine. Well, that was just terrific. Let's uh, thank Elaine one more time. And I almost forgot to present you with our 200%, I'm still working about that, uh, Wilderness Wear Rotary 100 Convention Socks. Fantastic, thank you. <laughs> Terrific, thank you. In closing, I'd like to thank our visitors and guests for attending and a warm welcome to our newest members, uh, Joe Crouston and Manuel Philippe Marquez. Thanks also to our MC and reflection given by past President Peter Dakin and our lunch set up and reception team for their weekly effort in making this meeting happen. Please, if you can stay back a few minutes to assist with the pack up, that would be appreciative. And a reminder that next week, there is no evening meeting, despite it being the second Wednesday of the month. Instead, we meet here at number 35 for our 2023 Monash Medal presentation to Richard Elkington OAM. Join us and consider inviting a guest to hear from a leader in our community. Mm -hmm.